Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Across the Dinerverse. Searching for the heart and soul of America, one diner at a time. How you doing? I'm John Murphy, a writer and producer on the science and technology series Innovation Nation with Mo Rocca, which airs Saturday mornings on CBS. Check your local listings for airtime. And now I drive interstates, highways, and backcountry roads looking for just the right diner to talk to people over garbage egg scrambles, secret recipe cornbread, and fried trout with the heads left on about their lives, their town, and how they feel about America. I'm in the middle of a series of episodes surrounding a true crime, originating from the Anvil Bar and Grill in Curtis, Nebraska, known all over for their prime rib and $3 vodka sodas. Four bucks if you want top-shelf vodka like Tito's or Grey Goose. I mean, that alone almost makes me want to move back home. For this episode, I'll be talking with former Frontier County Sheriff Lanny Rob Lee about the Hoyt murder case, which happened 50 years ago in southwest Nebraska and crossed over three different counties. And not only involved his office, but the Nebraska State Patrol, the Red Willow County Sheriff's Department, and the McCook, Nebraska Police Department. Now, you have to understand how sensational this murder case was. It made national news. Newsweek magazine did a feature story on it. It was in all the supermarket tabloids like the National Enquirer. And articles about the case were picked up by the Associated Press and United Press International and were republished in major papers all over the country. So why were people so fascinated about the murder of Edwin and Wilma Hoyt? Well, it was the salacious details of their daughter Kay Hines' relationship with a married couple, Harold and Ina Noakes. I mean, it was a swinging 70s, and people were very curious about how this new open lifestyle worked, or didn't. In a few moments, you will hear, for the first time, Kay and Harold tell their story from official tape depositions and interviews. To recap the first two episodes of this series... Edwin and Wilma Hoyt disappeared from their rural farm on the evening of Sunday, September 23, 1973. Earlier that summer, the family endured a public shaming of sorts when vulgar comments about Kay began appearing on numerous local road signs, and all of the comments regarded sexual acts Kay was willing to do for anybody for as little as $10. And here's where it gets interesting. The signs also included the names of other men including Kay's boss at the construction company where she worked, as well as the owner of a well-established car dealership. And the question was obvious. Did these men have anything to do with the disappearance of the Hoyts? Kay and Harold started an affair in early 1970, when Kay's then-husband, Dwayne Hine, worked for Harold at the Nebraska Department of Roads. In the fall of 1971, Kay divorced Dwayne, got the house and custody of their two daughters, and kept seeing Harold, dreaming one day he would leave his wife, Ina, and marry her. Eventually, Harold confessed the affair to Ina, who, not wanting to lose the man she'd been married to for over 25 years, allowed Harold to keep seeing Kay, and in fact told him to bring her home so they could all enjoy each other. Now, a side note here. From extensive research done by attorney and author James Hewitt, who wrote a book about the case called In Cold Storage, Ina had had eyes on Harold early on, all the way back in high school, and got pregnant, perhaps deliberately, to catch him. And as far as we know, Ina was the only woman Harold had ever been with. And now, he has two women, giving him all the emotional and physical attention any man could want, all agreed to by Harold, Kay, and Ina. But about after nine months of sleeping with each other multiple times per week, the intensity of their sexual fantasies playing out in real time was waning. Jealousy and resentment undermined the three-way relationship, and soon, Kay was trying to get out of it. There was a major argument during a road trip to Kansas City. Kay called Harold a son of a bitch, and Harold slapped her around, giving Kay a black eye. And at one point, Harold and Ina coerced Kay to their home where Harold handed Kay his deer rifle and asked her to shoot him. Kay ran for the door. Harold chased after her, but tripped and fell off his porch, severely dislocating his shoulder. But did Kay keep running? No, she didn't. She went back to help him. 
So some part of her still was hopeful that she could win Harold away from Ina. But the emotional toll on Kay was heavy. Her life was falling apart, and she was acting irrationally. This is American Gothic, Love and Murder, Part 3. Did you at some time attempt to take your own life? I took some pills, yes. They called over, and I told them just to leave me alone. Just to forget it. Just to leave me alone. And he says, well, you've got to talk to us. You've got to talk to us. You've got to get this. You've got to... It'll work out and all this and that. And I said, just leave me alone. I'm getting supper. He would call and hang up and I'd answer it. And the tape recorder during Kay's interview there just malfunctioned. So we pick up the story from Harold. And just a note about the audio. Harold spoke very softly, and a lot of audio sweetening had to be done to make his words audible, so you may hear some sudden spikes of loudness. You should just really pay very close attention. Let me just get right to it. Didn't she try to commit suicide one time? Yes. Well, tell me about that. Well, I got home from work that one evening, and uh, the wife was talking to Kay on the phone, and she said Kay didn't sound quite right. We want to go over just as we got over there. Boy, it was on the cot there, and one of the kids slid down beside the cot. And why it made her sweat, I don't know, but she got furious and took her bell off. She took her in the bedroom, and far as actually wetness, and I did, but you could hear her giving uh, the girl quite a lick. And I told her I didn't think that was necessary, and she just went hysterical. And, and I thought I seen her take her hand down from her mouth, but I wasn't sure. Good. I seen her throw an empty bottle, and I still didn't really feel like she tried to commit suicide, but she went and took $20 from my shirt pocket and told me see if the kids had money to buy flour, and so that scared me, and I called her folks. And what did you tell her folks? I, I called her mother and told her that the exact words I don't remember, but I related to them anyway that I thought, you stayed there with her until her father showed up? Did he Did he have uh, Mrs. Hoyt with her? No. And uh, how much longer after you called did he come over? Uh, I would say 15, 20 minutes. And had Kay passed out or done anything differently between the time you called and the, he arrived? Just got the hysteric was all and told us leave and called us a lot Was that after uh, the incident that Salina? Yes, then, um, after she went to the hospital, uh, did you have any, was there any sexual relations at all? This time when she tried to commit suicide? I wouldn't say for sure. I don't believe so, but whether it was or not, I don't know. I can't. I might have seen her once or twice after that, but I, I... You think, you know, when you say you might have seen her, you mean you might have seen her just alone to have relations with her? Yes, I would say it been... Just you? It, yes, it been just me, yes, sir. Was, but I'm not real sure whether it was afterwards or not. At least you're sure if there was, it wasn't the three of you. Uh, that's my belief anyway. That's right. yes. After Harold called Kay's parents and Edwin Hoyt arrived at Kay's house to take her to the hospital, Kay relates the awkward interaction between Harold and her father. And then he looked at my dad, and dad says, what's going on here? I said, yeah. I said, you just run ahead and, and go ahead. And Harold said, I don't know. I said, no. I said, you don't know a thing. I said, innocent little Harold. And I was, I was very angry at him in the first place. And then they left. And uh, and Daddy asked me if I had taken some pills, and I said yes, that I had. And he says, are you all right? And I said, I'll be all right. And so I, Daddy called the doctor, and, and we went right down to the hospital. What was that here? Down to Holdridge. I had a pretty rough night that night. And it was very, very stupid. And I guess this is why I'm this strong now, because something's happened to my folks, and they're trying to get to me any way they can. And they don't think that I'm strong enough to take this. The girls have to be with their father right now. The family thinks that 
it's best for the girls to be with him for their safety at this time. Now, after that, when you went to the hospital in Holy Beach, did you ever see Harold again? Yes. I was tricked into seeing him. I was at work. The phone rang. And Ina called and said that she was opening some boxes up at the schoolhouse and that she'd cut her hand and they'd wrapped it up at the schoolhouse but it had soaked through the bandage and stuff and she'd stop at the house to rewrap it and she really needed some help and she sounded very sincere, very... She hated to bother me at work and everything but but she needed some help and she couldn't get a hold of Harold at the job. And I stupidly believed her, and I went over to help her. I can't remember if I knocked or just exactly if the door was open or just exactly what, but anyway, as I went in, the door shut behind me, and Harold was standing behind the door, and I just scared the death of me. And she said, well, this is a dirty way of getting me over here tricking you to get you over here, but they didn't know what other way to do it, that I would come, because I wouldn't come back. Had they called you before that? Kind of yes, they had called several times, wanted me to come and talk to them, and this and that. And I promised my dad that I'd never see him anymore after this had happened. He asked me if I, he said, you've done, maybe you've done wrong, you've seen an old man and everything, and he said, but he says, all you can do now is make a right out of the wrong. And and Harold wouldn't leave Ina for me, and I couldn't go along with it anymore. Harold once again reiterated his position. He would not, would not leave Ina for Kay. But the thought of losing her was also too much for him to bear. Harold was suffering extreme withdrawal. Kay was Harold's like crack cocaine, and he didn't want to lose his fix. The man interrogating Harold is special counsel Paul Douglas from Lincoln, who would go on to become the Nebraska State Attorney General. Did you, her father ever talk to you, or did you ever talk to her father? Uh, not too long after. Uh, she tried to commit suicide by, I stopped on the evening to, uh, they only got off work and asking to see how she's getting. And where, where was her father? That's where he got off work at the plumbing shop there. You went to see him or her? Him. I, went to, I stopped to see him and see how Kay was getting. Was there any particular reason why you stopped to see him, Mr. Hart? No, I hadn't seen him since the time that uh, he picked her up over there. Yes, but why would you want to go see him? Well, I just want to see how she, Kay was getting along because that's the only thing I did. I want to see how Kay was getting along. Why didn't you just call Kay up and find out how she was getting along? I uh, felt like he'd come on there and find out from her father, then he went from her. What did her father say to you? Uh, he got a little irritated that said that Paul K was uh, under station and was down to hold it. He said that I was blackmailing her. He was real irritated about that part. What did you say to him when he said that to you? Well, I didn't know where he got the blackmail part. Well, hadn't you made some demand on Kay for some money? Didn't ask her for any money. She brought, uh, when this all came up, I told her that, that uh, it had been quite an expense. And, and she did bring over some money, and I told her I didn't want it. How much money did she bring over? She brought over, over about $400 in that neighborhood. I don't know exactly what it was. Was it cash or checks? Yes, it's cash. It was in an envelope. And she gave it to me, and I told her I didn't want her money. And she showed it on the television all the time. And did you keep the money? I left it lay there, and I told her on the phone every time that I didn't want her money, and she said it's mine, and to keep it. Had you then called her so periodically to talk to her about it? I called her and I talked to her about this, and I, I called her more time to see how her kids was getting along. Did you like I got show? I got rather attached to the children because they was over there quite a bit, and, and we I played games with them, and got so and Kate asked me to try to help raise them, and I. I allowed myself to get more involved with the children than I should have. Did you not make a demand on her for an additional $1,000 over and above the 400 No. And, and you're telling me that you didn't even demand the $400? No, I didn't. I, when she brought it over, I told her that I didn't want her money. Did the father then say to you that uh, you were blackmailing her? That's what he said. After that, 
And so, did you ever see Kay again? Uh, which is the, you're referring to when I talked to her father? Right. I don't believe it. After Kay's suicide attempt, Edwin took her to a psychiatric clinic in Holdridge, Nebraska, about 73 miles east of McCook. The attending physician was a Dr. McConaughey, who just happened to be Harold Noakes' uncle. Did Harold know that, that uh, you talked to some of your dad? Yes, he did. He said his uncle, when he went back down to the doctor's office, he was by a lot of his uncles and everything. And he said that was one man that he brought the world of and everything. And he was great. And that he said, ever since I had been down there, after I'd taken those pills, that something had changed. Well, Dr. McConaughey had talked to me. He asked me what I did this for and why. And it came out that there was an, I was involved with a married man. And that we had a big fight and everything. And he asked me, he said, well, now, I said, do you think it was worth going through what you went through that night? And I said, no. I said, nobody feels that. And he says, okay, he says, do you think that, he says, do you think you can handle yourself? I don't remember the exact words. He said, he, he says, now he says, are you stupid enough to do anything like this again? And I said, I'll never do this again, no matter what, under any circumstances. You don't, when you've done something like that, you learn, I guess. It was very stupid, and I didn't want to was trying to protect my folks from any hurt that I might have caused them from this. And, uh, but he said that Dr. McConaughey was very cold to him and very, I don't know. And my dad had talked to McConaughey, I think. And I told McConaughey that I had been, and he asked me if this is what it was, if any married man was worth this. And I told him no, and he asked me if I'd, see this man again? And I said, no, I never would. He says, I think you've learned your lesson. And I said, I learned it the hard way. Kay didn't tell Dr. McConaughey that the man she'd been seeing was his nephew. I mean, maybe she didn't want to embarrass herself, or maybe she was trying to spare McConaughey the pain of knowing the truth. But one thing was certain. Kay appeared to be done and done with Harold and Ina. Well, after she'd spent all the time over there, any free time she had, she'd always come over and then all of a sudden she quit. Why? There was something wrong. Well, isn't it a fact, Mr. Noakes, that you were trying to get her to come back and have relations with you some more? Uh, I wasn't nearly so interested in the sexual relations. I just enjoyed having her around in the company and we played cards. And... Well, then, is it fair to say that you were trying to get her to come back in your company again? Yes. And um, did she say no, she didn't want anything more to do with you? Yes. I felt like it, it was tore me apart when she left. I thought a lot of Kate. Well, then, you did want her more than just to come back to, to play cards with, didn't you, Mr. Noakes? Well, I enjoyed the. I thought a lot of Kate, and I loved Kate, and I uh, hated to see her leave. Yes. But uh, I enjoyed the, the other things. I would say much more than the sex part of it. But it was the sex part that was keeping you together, really, wasn't it? Uh, I think from her standpoint it was. But as far as my part, it wasn't. I mean. Well, let's talk about that sex part. Wasn't it it's your insistence that she and your wife were doing things uh, uh, together uh, sexually? I got the impression she thought just as much of it as I did. But what was that your suggestion that your request that they that the two women uh, do the things that they did with each other sexually? Uh, yes. And isn't it fair to say that the two women did things with each other sexually to play to give you pleasure, to satisfy you? Uh, I felt like that uh, they enjoyed each other as much as I enjoyed. You think your wife enjoyed having an affair with another woman? Uh. Probably not now, but at the time I thought she did. She uh, thought a lot of Kay. And did you think Kay was enjoying having uh, sexual relations with your wife? She uh, said she did. But she said that because that's what you wanted her to do, wasn't it, Mr. Noakes? Uh, all I know is what she said. She begged me to never change and keep things just like it was. Then um, you told her uh, 
what was it? That she, it was tearing you apart, not being with her? Yeah. And then what did you say when you offered her the gun? Uh, I thought she just well kill me one way or the other. And did you think it was killing you not to be with her? A certain amount, yes. You were still in love with her? Yes. Yeah. You think she was still in love with you? I thought she was. You never did find out what the ill feeling was that you had reference to. Uh, that part I don't know. In an interview with a private investigator hired by the Hoyt family to help find Edwin and Wilma, who were at the time only missing, Detective Robert Sodden asked Kay Point Blank about the Noakeses. This is from the official transcript. Question. Why did you stop participating in these sex activities with the Noakeses? Kay. I couldn't take it anymore. I loved Harold, and I was sure that she wouldn't go for this, and I was so sure that he would leave her, and I just wanted to be a person a whole person, and he didn't want that. I wanted him alone. Question. You didn't want to share him with his wife? K. No. I tried. I really tried. Question. K. Was there any problem or disagreement when you chose to terminate this activity? K. He said I would be sorry someday. Question. What reaction did you get from Ina Noakes? K. She thought I was terrible. Question. Do you have a feeling of or any reason to believe that Ina Noakes had any feelings of affection for you in a sexual way? K. She always said it helped their life an awful lot and that it wasn't the same without me. After Kay ended the affair, strange things began to happen. Her lawn was killed with chemicals. Her car's engine was ruined when something foreign was poured in the gas tank. And a red light bulb was mailed to her home. What had happened to your car? It had either paint thinner or sugar put in the gas tank. Completely ruined it. Did your mother know anything about uh, you having had an affair with her? Yes. Was there anything mentioned that day about No, my folks never, from the time I come home from Holdridge down there, the folks never confronted me with it. They never, what you would say, if they'd get disgusted with me or anything like this, they never brought this up. And they knew that I was through with this, that, I mean, this was just it. And that, like Dad told me, he says, you've done, you've got her wrong now. He says, all you can do now is go ahead and try to make it right. Did you ever visit with him about the signs or about the... Yes. We wore signs until maybe 2 o'clock in the morning. We got out of the wheat field one night, went on the highway and wore signs till I think it was about 2 o'clock that morning. And Harold confronted my dad before they went to Germany. How I know is he called, told me that my dad was one of the lowest persons he ever knew. And he was terrible and sick and he was that. And I told him I wasn't listening to this kind of stuff and he wasn't talk about my dad. I didn't talk about his folks. He wasn't to talk about my father either. And I hung up. And I said, my dad would just be sticking up for me like you'd stick up for your own daughter. Did you when, when you were washing signs and, and, and you had the problem with your grass and you had the problem with your car did, uh, did you ever visit with your folks about who might have done that? Yes. And what did they think? That was helping. Did you ever have a chance to talk to your dad about uh, whether or not he could talk to Harold? I never did, no. By now, Edwin and Wilma were fully aware of what Kay had done with the Noakeses and encouraged her to move on with her life. But Edwin was not going to let Harold get off the hook so easily. Had you received any other telephone calls from Mr. or Mrs. Hoyt before they went to Germany? Uh, Mr. Hoyt called a couple of times. And what was it that he said to you both times that he called? Uh, he was telling, he was real aggravated. The main thing that bothered him was, uh, about Kate coming to our place and staying as she got out of the hospital. That seemed to be his biggest complaint. Trying to blackmail Kate. You were trying to what? Blackmail Kate. As much as you probably hate to talk about it, I'd like to talk about those signs that were painted along. Yeah. Uh, you know about those? Yeah. And uh, do you know who painted those signs? 
I've seen it a few of them. I didn't think near all of them, but I didn't find a few of them. And can you tell me which signs you painted and what you wrote on the signs that you painted? Uh, I wrote uh, some south town, and the ones I painted involved her. Tell me again why you painted the signs. Well, I'd seen some that others just painted, and I thought, well, I ought to, I don't know, I, I painted some also. But you didn't tell me why you painted them. Mm, that's hard to explain. I don't know why. I felt like she had hurt me an awful lot, and I guess I tried to hurt her back a little. Well, why were you trying to hurt her? Well, that's something I can't explain. I don't know myself. I wonder myself. Something you don't want to tell me about or something you really don't know? I really don't know. Isn't it kind of childish? I would say so. And up to now, at least your conducts have been very mature. I guess it's jealousy as much as anything. I think, and by this time, I'd heard a lot of stories of what hurt me greatly. And you figured that she was no longer having relations with you and she was having relations with somebody else. And you wanted to hurt her. Well, having relations with several of them, but I'd heard, I don't know. Nothing that I knew her facts, but I understood that she had an awful lot of relations with her. Then it's fair to say you were putting the signs up because you wanted to hurt her. I would say so, yeah. I mean, I think that's what she said. But I but I didn't paint near all the signs. I didn't paint some, but I didn't paint them. Well, who painted some of the other ones? I didn't know. Did your wife paint some? No. Did you tell your wife you were painting the signs? No. As far as I know, she didn't know. But there was a sign painted in a woman's restroom somewhere, is my name. Uh, she did, that. I didn't know what it did, and I'm sure she did. In fact, uh, when they asked questioning something, they brought up signs that I didn't know had been painting. Just now, talked about some downtown restrooms. I didn't know what it was about. All the signs that you painted were out on the road? Uh, on the road, and I painted a few too late. Tell me what you would say normally on the signs that you had painted. Uh, I painted some that uh, she was easy to make and would go for $10 or anything on that nature. Why did you pick the ten dollars amount? I think I put some as five. I I'm sure I did. Okay. Now how about the 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 grass? Uh as I told them uh last spring, the early K wanted me to get her some ground killer. And uh, so I got her some two gallon jugs I mixed up but uh, and then she brought it back and I told her not to bring it back because if she did I'd put it on her bushes. And she brought it back anyway. And, I did that for something. And yeah. why did you do that? Another thing, I guess you'd say, that I was trying to hurt her. She... How about the uh, sugar? I put sugar in that car once again. Why? Same reason. And that reason is? Uh, I was trying, at the time I felt like I was trying to get even. How about the light bulb? Uh, why? Center of all. And did you know about it? Yes. And why was at that the same? time, uh, Kay said she didn't have a red light bulb, so I told the wife to fix her up and send her. When did she tell you she didn't have a red light bulb? Uh, that had been long in about the time that uh, she tried to commit suicide. It might have been that night, I don't know. Well, did you make some reference to a red light bulb? Uh, I made some reference to why she wanted to lose if she wanted to start running around a lot or something to that effect. And she said, well, she didn't have a red light bulb, so I told the wife to send her didn't she try to commit suicide because you'd made some reference to her being an easy lay and that she had a red light bulb that she put out all the time? Not that I know of. Yeah, but you did mix that time, that day, you did have some conversation with her about her being promiscuous, didn't you? Uh, I can't say it either, because I actually don't know, but I think that I might have. And that's, I think, from the light bulb, she said that she didn't have a it should be noted that at this time in the early summer of 1973, Harold Noakes's right shoulder was still healing from its dislocation when he fell off his porch chasing after Kay, and Harold was right-handed, a critical point to remember later on. Attorney Paul Douglas continues questioning Noakes. Now, was there anything else said to Kay uh, outside of uh, the red light that you know of? Uh, you were... Referring to the night that you tried to commit suicide. No, at any other time. Did you mailed her some. You mailed her a red light bulb. That's correct. Yes. Was there anything else that was made mailed to her with the intent of uh, insulting or hurting her? No. 
Anything else uh, except the writing of the sign? Yes, I did some of that. And, and the, the burning of the lawn. And the uh, sugar in the uh, automobile. Yes. And the red light bulb. Yes. Anything else? Nothing that I can think of. Okay. Now, when did you uh, next see Kay after, after the time that you hurt your shoulder? I never have seen her. Do you know when you bought that pistol, the twenty-two? Uh, we covered that a while ago, didn't we? I think it's July or August. Okay. And do you know when the Hoyts went to Germany? I didn't know any of that, no. Do you know when they came back? No, I didn't know until after. It was just after the Hoyts returned from Germany visiting their youngest son, Stanley, that they disappeared. Despite Kay's past indulgent, self-destructive behavior, Edwin and Wilma still loved and supported their daughter. After my dad and I went on a trip that we went down to Holdridge, my dad and mom and I were closer than I'd ever been to my folks in my entire life. And I needed the folks very much because they're all I had. That's all kids had. Now they're going. Folks come up here all the time, quite a bit. I mean, just like run in for a minute or use the phone or something. He said, go to sail with them to the sail barn, go out and have a big fence. I mean, that was just to get out of town. We could talk about anything and everything, and we were just very close. When Edwin and Wilma went missing, Kay was frantic. She knew something wasn't right. I couldn't understand anything Monday. I mean, I couldn't. And Tuesday, I was scared. When I called on, I was scared. Uh, I was frantic Tuesday morning. And he, and he's so calm anyway. And he was, oh, just this, you know, and this. And I was worried Monday. And I couldn't understand because Dad doesn't do this. And they don't leave me without telling me they're going to be gone so that I know. Ina called over here and asked if she could help do anything during, I don't remember what day it was or anything, but during the process of our hunting for the folks. Uh, have you talked to Harold since? Yeah. The night before last. I went through hell for the last two months, and I just called. I don't know why I called him. He called, I thought maybe he'd talk to me or something, and I, he wouldn't talk. And I kept hanging up the phone. Did he talk to you at all? Not very much. And then he always called when he had problems and everything. Does he give you any indication? Do you have any indication that he or him may have been involved with what happened prior to this time? What do you mean? Well, I wouldn't tell you what happened prior to the time that we were both on the journey. Do you have any indication that he was, that either or both of them were responsible for the coach's uh, disappearance? Yes, I feel this way. Has he ever said anything to you? All of the threats and everything that he would hurt me some way he was going to hurt me and I'd pay for this. Some way he was going to hurt me as much as I hurt him when I walked out. Definitely. And he's, he's hurting. I'm not only missing the folks, like I said, I've got two kids. This way he can hurt double. And this is what he wanted to do. With all his threats and everything, this is what he kept saying. He had hurt me. Are you seeing him all since? Down at the state patrol office. And he isn't the same person he was at all. Neither is she. In all way. Every way. He's not normal. He's he just looks sick. I mean he just Physically. Yeah, every way. And he just looks like he's got something on his mind and he just he just isn't he just isn't the person that he was. Awesome. He thinks that my dad told Dr. McConaughey 
And that's a critical point here. Harold Noakes admired and respected his uncle, Dr. McConaughey, who treated Kay after her suicide attempt. Kay and Dr. McConaughey discussed her cleaning up her act, ending the affair, getting her life back on track, but she never said who the married man was. But apparently, her father did. Deliberately. To shame Harold in front of a family member. As mentioned earlier by Kay, Dr. McConaughey suddenly started treating Harold very differently. Maybe cut off their relationship. We'll never know for sure. But whatever happened, it angered Harold. And the same week the Hoyts disappeared, Kay got a call. Uh, the phone was ringing. I answered my phone at the office, and it was Harold. And uh, he started saying, well, that that uh, his dad had gotten home and that he was uh, he shouldn't have come home from the hospital, but his dad just wanted to come home, so he, he was going to go up and see if he couldn't get his dad to go down to the hospital. At that time, I wanted to tell him just to take his own troubles and solve them yourself because I had a lot more myself. I didn't say anything, but I... I wanted to tell him I had a lot heavier problems than worrying about getting somebody to the doctor, and I couldn't even find my folks. He knew where his was, but I didn't say anything at all. He hung up. Ten days later, on Wednesday, October 3rd, human body parts began to surface along the Medicine Creek Dam at Harry Strunk Lake, 34 miles northeast of McCook. These were the nine remains recovered that day. A right female breast, a left foot, apparently female, A large piece of skin, approximately 4 inches by 7 inches, with what appeared to be a bullet hole in it. The hole was edged with black, which appeared to be powder burns. A right lower forearm and hand, female, with a ring on the third finger, containing five very colored stones, which would be the birthstones of the Hoyt's grandchildren. A part of the right pelvic bone, apparently female. Lower half of a femur, a left breast, six ribs and part of a sternum belonging to a female, the upper half of a lower leg from just below the knee to the ankle, sex unknown, and a left lower forearm and hand belonging to a female with an engagement ring and a wedding band on the third finger. Because Harry Strunk Lake was in Frontier County, the 29-year-old sheriff, Lanny Rob Lee, became the lead investigator of what was now a murder case. I spoke with Lanny at the Anvil Bar and Grill in Curtis, Nebraska. How were you able to identify these body parts as actually belonging to Edwin and Wilma Hoyt? The obvious thing was that the rings were still on the finger of one of the hands, and the rings were identified to be from Wilma Hoyt. So the children identified the rings. That's right. And so you got confirmation that at least one of the bodies was, in fact, Will Mahoy. That's that's right. That that's how we felt anyhow, and we we knew from day one what happened. It was just a matter of being able to prove it. Rob Lee interviewed members of the Hoyt family, including Kay. I asked about his initial thoughts after meeting her for the first time. Kay was involved with lots of people, lots of men, and it was obvious that she was. Uh, a rounder, as you might say. <laughs> and Harold wasn't the only person that she was involved with. So you're interviewing Kay. You right. learn that she has been seeing a number of men, both married and unmarried men, some prominent businessmen, big names in town. What was your takeaway when she told you this story, that they might be the people who did it? You know, my takeaway was that Kay Hine, in her mind, knew what happened. And I don't think that she knew it because she was involved or there when it happened or anything like that. But just the progress of of how her relationship went. And uh, she, she knew what happened to those people. I had the opportunity to speak to Donna Elmer, Kay's sister, right. on the phone. I was trying to get her to be part of this podcast, and she initially agreed, and then she backed out, which I understand. She said, it's too painful for my family. I don't want to keep dredging this up again, which I respect and completely understand. But she did talk to me on the phone, and she related to me that she felt Kay had had much more to do with the situation, trying to orchestrate her parents meeting with the Noakeses to try and work something out over this relationship. 
I'm not sure that I agree with that exactly. The deal with her dad and mom was that they could read the road signs where they had the nasty things about Kay Hine, mm-hmm. and they were not pleased about that. You'd go into the women's restroom and see things written on the wall in the women's restroom. And so at that point, they felt that there was a woman involved in the situation, but I don't think that they thought it was Kay Hine. That she wasn't doing it herself. That's right. There has been some speculation that Kay Hine was dating all these men after she broke off the relationship with Harold and Ina as a way to make Harold jealous to win him back. Do you think that holds water? No, I don't I don't think so. I her life was not to, to make people jealous, I don't think. I don't think that she had that much of an attachment to Harold that she was trying to get him back. She was pretty much uh open to any offer that she had, as <laughs> near as I can tell. By now, Kay wasn't holding back or trying to hide anything. Oh, well, she just kinda told me how her life had been. Right. And that, I don't know that we got specific about uh, sexual anything, but mm-hmm. uh, it was obvious when she was going, meeting with married men and named them. She she was very free about what she would tell you, but uh, I gotta I gotta give you a true story. So my dad during this case was president of the McCook Chamber of Commerce. My dad was the manager of the J.C. Penney store in town, which is a big retail store where people from 70 miles around would come and shop there. And so he was, you know, he's a Rotarian and a Toastmaster and is a prominent guy. When I had the opportunity to read the unsealed court files and read the names of the men that she provided the authorities with who she was actually fooling around with, big car dealership guy, big a contractor construction guy. I'm like going down this list of names and I'm going, my dad plays golf with all these dudes. <laughs> I better not see his freaking name on this list. <laughs> I was having a childhood, you know, a meltdown crisis inside. So, and thank God I did not see my dad's name on the list, but I, I did get that little pucker in my, you know, you know what, when I got, Oh my God, here comes the list here. Oh no, here comes the list of names. Oh my God. There's my dad's name. No, so I, I, I am relieved that my father did not fall prey to her prowess. There, there you have it. Coming up, having a strong suspicion the Noakes killed the Hoyts was one thing, but building that case against them was a challenge for these small-town law enforcement officers. So how did you get the eavesdropping devices into their house? We, we went in through the back door and into the house and installed them up and got in the attic and put them in the lights. We, were they at work? They were at work and we were monitoring each one of them to I see. be sure that they weren't going to show up at the house. Wait a second. So you're doing this during the day? Yes. In regular d- daytime hours? Yes. Were people, the neighbors, like watching you guys do this? Yes. <laughs> 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 what did anybody like a neighbor walk over and go excuse me what are you doing breaking into our, my neighbor's house yes that <gasps> did happen oh, oh man all right hear the rest of the story next week on american gothic love and murder part four <laughs> and that wraps another episode of across the dinerverse A huge thank you to Marvin Fisher and the entire staff at the Anvil Bar and Grill in Curtis, Nebraska for hosting this podcast series. Learn more about them at anvilbarandgrill.com, and that's all one word, anvilbarandgrill.com. Thanks to retired Frontier County Sheriff Lanny Robley and author James Hewitt for their contributions, including case files and audio recordings. You can get Mr. Hewitt's book in cold storage through the University of Nebraska Press or on Amazon. And if you like the podcast and want to support the show, please visit my Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Dynaverse. Original theme music by Keith Brock and the Kings Who Rock. Across the Dynaverse. Searching for the heart and soul of America, one diner at a time. What's your story?